Hi everyone, I've created this short video to supplement some of the uh, regular lecture. Uh, and the content of this video is on neuroimaging. So we're going to talk about some neuroimaging techniques, primarily functional neuroimaging. Uh, and we'll go through some examples of each one. Uh, so functional neuroimaging, uh, that is to say, taking, uh, Im taking an image of the brain while it's doing something, and then making inferences about uh, what area of the brain is carrying out the task is possible because neurons generate an electrical impulse when they communicate with each other. So when a neuron fires, it uh, generates an electrical impulse in order to uh, activate additional neurons. Uh, and when they're doing this, uh, when neurons are uh, firing, they also require uh, oxygen, and that's delivered by the circulatory system. Uh, so we have uh, electrical impulses, and those can be measured. Uh, and we have cerebral blood flow, which can also be measured. So let's talk about the ways those can be done. First, though, uh, let's take an overview of the different kinds of techniques we're going to look at. I'm going to briefly talk about physical imaging, uh, that is to say non-functional, uh, which is a CAT scan. Uh, these are useful because they can help you identify uh, abnormalities in the brain, and they're often used to generate uh, an X-ray of the brain uh, that other neuroimaging techniques can be plotted on top of. Uh, so some of these techniques we'll talk about don't take pictures of the physical structure of the brain, uh, but we want to be able to see where the activity is located so we can plot it on top of a CAT scan. Uh, then we'll talk about techniques that uh, measure cerebral blood flow, that is to say the amount of oxygen that's being delivered to an area of the brain. Uh, and we'll talk about some techniques uh, that uh, measure the electrical or magnetic impulses uh, that are generated by the uh, electrical impulse uh, of a neuronal spike. So the CAT scan, the simplest one of these, well, it's not really simple from a physical standpoint because it's a complicated x-ray, uh, but it's physical from a functional standpoint because it doesn't have uh, the ability to record function. Uh, so the CAT scan is a computer ac computed axial tomography. Uh, sometimes you hear CT scan as well. Um, and this uses an x-ray, except it's a big circular x-ray. And you can see in the picture there, uh, the patient or the uh, person who's being imaged would uh, lie on the, uh, on the bed there uh, with their head in that little uh, sort of U-shaped cradle, slide into the x-ray machine. Uh, and it's a non-functional uh, image. So it takes a very detailed picture of the brain, uh, but doesn't take a picture of any of the activity uh, in the brain. Uh, just like an x-ray, uh, of you know your arm or something would take a picture of maybe broken bones in your arm, but it wouldn't necessarily uh, take a picture of what the muscles are doing while they're doing something active. Uh, this is useful though if you want to uh, localize uh, you know a tumor, for example. So here's a, a CT scan or a CAT scan of a, um, a patient with a, a brain tumor. Uh, in the temporal lobe. And you can see uh, each one of these uh, pictures uh, in the different uh, quadrants uh, shows a different, they call it a slice, but you can imagine a slice of the uh, cortex. Uh, so the top, the medium, the bottom. And so it's uh, looking down uh, on the cortex. And you can see the shape of that uh, tumor uh, in the temporal lobe. So again, non-functional, but useful for clinical uh, applications, and also useful if you want to uh, plot someone's uh, brain activity on top of uh, a, uh, a physical image. Uh, so let's talk about functional neuroimaging, and I want to talk about several of these. First is the PET scan. The PET scan st stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Uh, and the way this works is that the person who's going to be imaged uh, will drink something that contains a, a radioactive isotope that decays fairly quickly. Uh, as this uh, radioactive isotope is uh, metabolized, uh, it enters the blood flow uh, and uh, it you know, you know, decays, and as it decays, it emits uh, a radioactive signal. What that means is that anywhere in the body that is uh, requiring a little bit more of uh, you know, of the blood uh, is going to require more of this, is going to end up using up more of this uh, radioactive isotope. So it's a way to track where the blood is going. So if, uh, if you're using one of, if you're using your hands, for example, to do something, uh, your arm muscles would require a little bit more and some of the blood would go there and with it would be carried some of this decaying radioactive isotope. Same thing happens in your cortex. Uh, so if an area of the brain is active doing a cognitive task, so let's say you're uh, doing a memory task 
it's going to engage the temporal lobe, uh, the hippocampal areas, right? Uh, those areas are going to need a little bit more oxygen while they're doing the memory task, a little bit more uh, cerebral blood flow. Uh, so this blood flow will, um, the blood will be carried to the, uh, uh, the neurons for this purpose, and with it goes the radioactive isotope, uh, which can then be measured uh, by these detectors that surround uh, the person's head. So in this slide, um, I've shown uh, data that was collected from a uh, subject who was doing a memory task uh, while they were being imaged uh, with one of these uh, PET detectors. Uh, and uh, this also combines the detection from the PET scan uh, with a CAT scan, which takes an X-ray of the person's brain. Uh, so the gray that you see, the black and white uh, picture, the gray scale of the skull with the brain in it, that's the CAT scan. Uh, the orange and yellow red uh, activity that you see looks like a heat map uh, that's the data that was collected by the PET scan. So in this case, while the subject is doing the memory task, uh, the hippocampal areas require a little bit more. Uh, uh, they're working harder to do this memory task. They require more uh, oxygen. The blood brings the oxygen, also brings with it the isotope, which is then measured and plotted. And you can see in this case that uh, when that subject is doing the memory task, that area is relatively more active. Uh, so PET, uh, unlike CAT scans, uh, allow you to see what's going on in the brain. In other words, which areas are active while the patient or the subject is doing something. The downsides to PET scan, of course, are that it is requires the patient to ingest something, a radioactive isotope. Uh, so there are other uh, techniques that have since been developed uh, for in neuroimaging which allow for good spatial resolution, like this PET scan, uh, with fairly good temporal resolution. In other words, uh, quickly uh, being able to measure something, you know, quickly after it, ha shortly after it happens. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few of these. Uh, the most common um, is the functional magnetic resonance imaging. So functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, uh, is another technique to measure cerebral blood flow. Uh, and here you can see one of the uh, fMRI magnets being installed at Robarts. Uh, so this is the uh, Robarts Research Institute at Western. Uh, and uh, this is in a, a picture of one of the magnets being installed uh, a number of years ago. So this is down by University Hospital. Uh, we have a really big neuroimaging center uh, at Western, so functional neuroimaging is one of the core strengths of the cognitive neuroscience uh, area and the medical uh, neuroscience areas uh, here at the university. Uh, the way fMRI works is it operates on the same general assumption uh, that PET uh, operated on, which is to say areas of the brain which are active during a task require uh, additional oxygen, cerebral blood flow, and you can measure that. But rather than measuring the decay of a radioactive isotope, um, what the uh, fMRI measures is what's known as the uh, blood oxygenation level. And let's talk a little bit about how that's done. Uh, so this is referred to as the BOLD function, blood oxygenation level dependent. Uh, so blood flow increases as a function of neural activity. Uh, what that means though, and remember back to, um, uh, remember back to maybe what you learned uh, in a biology class or an anatomy class if you've taken one. Uh, when the circulatory system is operating, it carries oxygen to cells that need it, right? Uh, that's what your circulatory system does. Uh, carries oxygen, and then it leaves those areas uh, with carbon dioxide. So it's exchanging things, right? It goes in red and it comes out a little bit blue, right? So there's a difference. Oxygen-rich blood flows to an area, the oxygen is taken out by the cells, and then the uh, blood returns to the heart, uh, oxygen depleted. So there's a difference between those two, and it turns out that the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin changes the magnetic field, and that can be measured by a very powerful magnet. Uh, so in the fMRI uh, system, uh, which in practice resembles that CAT scan, so it's still a big device that you slide into, uh, rather than an x-ray, it's a big magnet that's measuring this uh, bold function. Like the fMRI, or like the, CAT, the PET scan, the fMRI can uh, be plotted on top of an image, uh, and the heat map shows the relative activation. Now, the way these are typically done, by the way, uh, in both cases, uh, is something what's known as a subtractive technique. 
a subtractive technique means that in order to plot the area that's active, you have to have a control as well. So in a control task, you might be uh, in the fMRI system, uh, asked to engage in a visual processing task, which is what, uh, let's say, a visual discrimination task, making a judgment about an object, uh, which is what this uh, plot would show, by the way, because the activity is uh, shown in the occipital lobe. Um, in a subtractive technique, uh, you would have the participant or the subject or the patient uh, take an fMRI, uh, do the tasks, uh, you know, do everything except for the task that you wanted to measure. So if it was a visual discrimination task in one case where maybe they had to make a response, uh, in the control condition, they would do everything uh, except make that response. So they would lay in the fMRI, they would see images, uh, all of that stuff would still happen. And then you would do another pass or another run of trials or another uh, measurement where they do everything that they did in the control condition plus that one thing that you want to measure, so an extra piece of information. Uh, you have activity measured in this case, activity measured in this case, and you subtract the difference. And what's left is the activity that was associated with that one thing that was different between the control and the experimental condition. So I hope that seems clear. You've got a control condition where subjects do a lot of things, uh, an experimental condition where they do the same things plus one more. Uh, you measure the activity during those, and what's left over uh, is the activity that you wanted to uh, target. And that's what this shows here. So, uh, you know, your brain is going to be active across the, lots of areas of the brain are going to be active while you're in an fMRI scan because lots of things are happening, right? Basic functions, uh, maybe you're thinking about the uh, noise that the fMRI machine makes. Uh, maybe you're a little bit nervous because you're laying on your back in a, in a big magnet, uh, in a big tube. Uh, maybe you're just thinking about lots of things. Uh, all of that activity can be subtracted out between the two conditions, and what's left over is that one thing uh, that you were interested in. In this case, this particular image shows uh, some visual processing in the back of the head. One of the really interesting things about functional neuroimaging is that you can, uh, there's a lot of, you can detect a lot of things. Uh, so here is one study uh, that was carried out by a team at Cambridge University, uh, and I want to highlight this one. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the lead authors, or the, the, the core author in this work, uh, is uh, Dr. Owen, uh, Adrian Owen, who is currently here at Western um, in the uh, uh, Department of Psychology and the uh, Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. Uh, so uh, Adrian uh, carried out some of this research initially in Cambridge. Uh, and has made a lot of progress in understanding consciousness using fMRI. Uh, so let's back up a little bit um, and talk about uh, disorders of consciousness. Um, this is not a core topic in the class, but in this case, a disorder of consciousness would be someone who is, uh, appears to be in a coma, uh, is non-responsive, but their basic physiology, so the areas of the brain that keep them alive, keep, their, keep them breathing, for example, uh, might still be active, but they show no awareness of anything else. So they don't respond to anything in the outside world. Uh, you can talk to them, but they show no sign of responding. So we sometimes call this vegetative uh, state uh, or a disorder of consciousness. So these, are, these patients are individuals who in the past uh, many would refer to as you know, brain dead, for example. That's not a clinical term, but that's probably a term you've heard uh, sort of a popular term, this person is brain dead, or this person is in a vegetative state. They're alive, but they show no awareness or no evidence of consciousness. So one of the downsides of many for a patient who is in this case is that uh, you don't know if they're conscious or if there's just an inability to uh, show that awareness. Where does the consciousness end? Are they aware of what's happening and just unable to uh, show that awareness, or are they completely unaware of what's happening? Uh, it's impossible to tell, or at least it was impossible to tell until uh, Dr. Owen's research. So Dr. Owen used an fMRI uh, and has since used uh, other neuroimaging techniques uh, in a really interesting way. Uh, so one of the things that we can do with neuroimaging is we can detect activation in areas where we expect to see it. Um, we're going to talk more about this when we talk about sensory motor activation, but uh, if I were to tell you uh, to lay still, not do anything, but imagine that you were playing tennis, 
Now, some of you may be able to cre close your eyes and in your mind's eye sort of imagine yourself uh, in a tennis match, right? Uh, others may have less clear ability to imagine the picture of playing tennis, but you can still imagine yourself uh, swinging a tennis racket uh, or maybe playing golf, let's say, if you're a golfer, uh, so swinging a golf uh, club. I can also ask you to imagine spatial information. So imagine uh, looking at the street uh, that you grew up on and walking down the street. Uh, so people do differ in their ability to experience a, a vivid image, but we can all do the imagery task as directed, and generally you can measure activity in the areas that would happen if the per patient was actually doing it. So. Panel A shows a patient, and panel B shows a control subject. And what you see is a, a sort of an area at the top of the brain. That's the motor area. And what that means is that when the patient and when the control subject, who's not a patient, is asked to imagine playing tennis, uh, they show activation in the area of the brain that would be active if they were actually playing tennis. In other words, the areas of the brain that correspond to uh, arm and grasping movement. Right. So. This means that uh, you can detect activity even if the patient isn't doing anything. So that's mental activity, a mental simulation that can be measured with an fMRI. Uh, what's interesting here, of course, and they've got a motor imagery task. The motor imagery in this case is playing tennis. Spatial imagery is imagining uh, looking at a street. Um, you can see that there's a close correspondence between the patient who is, in this case, uh, vegetative not communicating, shows no sign of awareness, no sign of anything, uh, any awareness of the outside world, and a control subject who is completely aware of the outside world. They both show the same pattern of activation. Uh, and this can be shown in two different kinds of imagery tasks. Um, so this is kind of interesting because it suggests that although they're not aware, uh, their brain is acting as if uh, they at least heard the word, imagine yourself playing tennis, right? Uh, so there's some indication that something's getting through. But the bigger question is, is the patient actually conscious? Uh, this does not show that the patient is conscious necessarily. It could just show that there's some passive uh, electrical and uh, uh, metabolic activity uh, in the brain when it hears the word tennis. Uh, so in a passive system, Hearing the word tennis should activate the neurons that have always been activated when the word tennis is heard, including simulation of the motor activity. Uh, you don't need to be conscious for that to happen necessarily. Likely you would be, but this doesn't, this doesn't necessarily rule out this passive explanation. But the next example does, and that's what the real um, sort of um, incredible part of this research is. Uh, once they could determine that some of their patients and their control subjects could reliably uh, imagine playing tennis and show activation in the tennis area uh, and show that that activation in the tennis area was different from the spatial imagery, right? So um, the spatial imagery and the uh, motor imagery are different at patterns of activation. One of them connected to tennis, one of them connected to imagery, uh, and they can be reliably dissociated from each other. So they're different responses. Uh, then you can tell the patient or tell the subject uh, to use those as yes and no responses. So in other words, uh, now you ask them questions. You say, if the answer to the question is yes, don't say yes, just imagine yourself playing tennis. And if the answer to the question is no, uh, imagine yourself navigating down the street. Uh, so two different tasks that produce two different areas, two different patterns of activation in the brain, one of them standing in as a proxy for a yes response, the other one standing in as a proxy for a no response, and you can use that to ask the subject and the patient questions. And you can see the patient on the left uh, with, uh, and, and by the way, notice the patient on the left uh, has some large dark areas uh, in the brain. Those are areas that are not active. So this is a patient who is missing a lot of their brain. Uh, and you can see in the control subject in panel B, uh, B in, in the right hand, uh, is your father's name Alexander? Uh, respond yes. And so for both patients uh, and controls, they can answer yes and no questions uh, reliably by imagining uh, this uh, tennis versus spatial navigation. This is a much stronger source of evidence that some of these patients, and in the paper you'll see, 
um, which and I'll put this up on our uh, course website. Uh, in the paper, you'll see that not everybody could do this, but some patients, a proportion of the patients, could do this. And this suggests that they were able to use this imagery task as a way to answer questions. Very difficult to uh, um, explain that away passively, right? The best explanation for this is that the patient was conscious. They could answer yes and no questions because they substituted imagining tennis for yes. So there's a substitution there that is not expected and not natural. So this is not just passive activation. Some of these patients, despite being locked in uh, and in a vegetative state and unable uh, to demonstrate any awareness, seem to demonstrate evidence of consciousness. So that's just one of the incredible things you can do with an fMRI. Uh, there's some limitations to fMRI, which we'll come to in the next few slides. Uh, but that is that it's fairly, it's noisy, right? It's a, it requires a big magnet. Uh, you've got to lay down in the big magnet. You have to lay still in the big magnet. Uh, it uh, makes a lot of noise. If you've ever been in an fMRI study or a clinical fMRI scan, uh, it's a very, it's, it's not a, it's not a pleasant experience. It's not unpleasant, but it's a little bit, a little bit scary. Um, so there are other techniques uh, which uh, can address that. Uh, one of these is known as FNIRS, or Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Uh, this uses lasers uh, to measure, near-infrared lasers, to measure cerebral blood flow. Uh, the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood flow uh, also has different uh, ref refractive techniques. So light is refracted and absorbed in slightly different ways depending on the concentration of oxygen in the blood. That can be picked up uh, with, those, uh, with these sensors. And this is a picture of some students in my lab uh, dem uh, practicing with an FNIRS uh, system. And you can see uh, one of my grad students who has the uh, has the cap on, uh, and one of the technicians uh, applying these uh, what looks like uh, wires uh, to the cap. And each one of those has a small sensor that either, a small laser that either pushes a light signal out or detects the light signal. And in the uh, left hand side uh, figure there, you can see this sort of banana shaped curve. Uh, something emits a signal and then it uh, bounces through the cortex uh, and can be detected. Uh, and it changes its it changes its characteristics depending on how much blood uh, is there. Uh, the upside to FNIRS, uh, there's a lot of upsides to FNIRS relative to fMRI. One is that it doesn't make any noise. Um, two, it can be fairly mobile. So the system that you see here is one that's connected to a computer, but you can also get FNIRS systems that can be uh, connected to a mobile computer. So people can move around. They can be on a treadmill or they can... Uh, walk from one place to the other. So you can get mobile uh, FNIRS uh, 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 signals. Uh, the downside, oh, and it's, it's quiet. There's no noise, right? It's just lasers. Uh, so you can have people listen to stuff. You can have them um, responding in different ways to a computer screen. You're just wearing something on your head. The downside is, as you can see in the uh, lower left there, uh, it tends to do it at the surface of the cortex. So unlike fMRI, which can penetrate deeply uh, to look at subcortical structures like uh, hippocampus, for example, uh, FNIRS can only detect things on the surface of the cortex, which is great, uh, but has a limitation relative to fMRI. Okay, so we've talked about the blood flow. Uh, we've talked about uh, PET scan, fMRI, and FNIRS using different technologies to measure the concentration of oxygen uh, in, uh, in the blood. Let's talk about a few techniques quickly that uh, use the alternative of measuring the electrical activity in neurons. The first of these, uh, and the oldest of these, and I think this might be the oldest of the neuroimaging techniques, is the electroencephalograph. Uh, and this uses, um, this uses electrodes to measure the electrical impulses. So each neuron as it's firing uh, is creating an electrical pulse, and you can use an electrode to measure that. Um, the EEG uh, uses these flat metal discs right at the scalp. This doesn't penetrate under the scalp, it's just right at the scalp, uh, and it can measure uh, this activity. Uh, it can do it um, really quickly, almost in real time. So. Uh, one of the downsides of uh, the uh, metabolic uh, imaging, the FNIRS and the uh, fMRI, is that it does take some time, right? So as the area of the brain is active, uh, it takes, you know, a second or two, or less than a second, actually. It's, you know, a few hundred milliseconds uh, 
uh, to be able to detect those changes for the blood flow. Uh, with electrical impulses, you're able to pick up the neuron almost as it's firing. Uh, uh, so that gives you a better, uh, what's known as a better temporal resolution. The downside is that it has a lower spatial resolution, so you can't localize uh, in the same tightly controlled way as you can with uh, the metabolic uh, measures. So EEG in general uh, has a lot of uses uh, in terms of being able to uh, measure different uh, brain waves as they happen. But one of the more interesting uh, components of EEG is the ability to uh, measure electrical activity during or right after something is presented to a subject, a visual stimulus, or right after they make some kind of response. Uh, and what, the way this works is uh, what's known as an event-related potential. So you use this electroencephalograph uh, to measure electrical activity right after the participant has seen something. And this is known as an ERP. So the ERP, or the event-related potential, is using this EEG technology, so the ability to measure electrical activity, but tying it to an event. That's why it's an event-related potential. Uh, this measures electrical activity after a stimulus is presented. Um, you can see on the left-hand side there, it's a similar technique where you've got a lot of uh, sensors. Uh, and on the right-hand side shows just sort of a schematic uh, or a hypothetical uh, electrical impulse, where after a stimulus is presented, you'll see a little positive spike, a negative electrical spike, and then positivity as the, um, as the neuron recovers from that spike. So the spike is the neural, neuronal firing. Uh, usually a few hundred milliseconds or a few milliseconds after uh, something happens. This is really interesting in cognitive neuroscience and has been used a lot uh, to detect things like um, uh, the resolution of ambiguity or detecting something that's unexpected. It's really useful in things like uh, reading research or visual perception uh, or decision making. Here's an example. Uh, so one of the most well-known or most stable effects in ERP research is known as the N400. Uh, the N400 is, uh, uh, refers to a negative spike uh, in, the electro, in the neuron uh, in its electrical activity about 400 milliseconds after something that's unexpected. Um, so here's an example. Suppose you're given a sentence and then you're given one of three words. Uh, one of them makes sense. Uh, one of them uh, makes less sense, and one of them really makes no sense. Um, the pizza was too hot to, and then you would hear, the pizza was too hot to eat. Makes sense. Pizza was too hot to drink. Kind of doesn't make sense, but maybe semantically at least you could imagine that if you were drinking a pizza, if it is too hot to eat, it's also too hot to drink, right? Uh, it's too hot to cry makes no sense. It's a word. It's a word that fits in the right place grammatically, but semantically it makes no sense, so the meaning is wrong. Uh, and what you see there is a difference in electrical activity. When the subject hears the pizza was too hot to cry, there's a very big, relatively speaking, a bigger negative spike. Uh, and that's differentiated from the pizza was too hot to drink, pizza was too hot to eat. So even before you might be aware of it, so being able to indicate by pressing a button, uh, your brain is clearly showing that it noticed something it didn't expect. Uh, so you're hearing a sentence or you're reading a sentence, pizza was too hot to cry, uh, and your brain registers surprise. Uh, and we can pick this up 400 milliseconds after uh, that surprise. So this is a really good temporal resolution. It's able to detect something almost as quickly as your brain registers it. So the same electrical impulse that uh, you can measure using electrodes for EEG and ERP also changes the magnetic field, which you can detect uh, with mag sophisticated magnetic detectors. This is known as MEG, or magnetoencephalography. Oh, that's quite a mouthful. Uh, MEG uses changes in the magnetic field to localize activity in the brain. Uh, so this has an improved spatial resolution relative to EEG and ERP, um, and also the same kind of um, a high spatial resolution that an fMRI has. Uh, as you can see, it's also open, so the patient is not laying in a big tube, uh, so they can see, they can respond to visual stimuli on the screen. 
Uh, and it has some downsides, of course. It's uh, like a lot of these other uh, sophisticated techniques, uh, also pretty expensive. It's stable, unlike the uh, EEG uh, and the FNIRS systems. Uh, so we've looked at a lot of them. Let's summarize them all um, and look at some of the relative costs and benefits and techniques that are being used. And this will, next slide will be the final slide. So let's wrap this up and summarize. Um, some of the techniques uh, measure the, the, the metabolism. So they measure the uh, differential on blood oxygenation or this blood flow. Uh, that's FNIRS and fMRI. FNIRS can penetrate uh, fairly deeply and image uh, lots of subcortical structures, has very high temporal, or very high spatial resolution. Uh, FNIRS uh, can measure things at the, you know, just a few centimeters, a few millimeters into the cortex, so at the surface of the cortex. Um, but it's also measuring this metabolic uh, signal. Uh, one imaging techniques that depend on the electrical impulse, uh, whether it's MEG or EEG, are picking up things much more quickly because they're picking up uh, signals that are given off by uh, the electric potential. Uh, so let's look at some of the costs and benefits. Um, the y-axis here just shows sort of hypothetical performance. There's nothing being measured here. This is just saying, relatively speaking, uh, you can see MEG, EEG, F fMRI, and FNIRS. Uh, with blue being MEG, uh, red being F FNIRS. Um, for temporal resolution, so temporal resolution is being able to uh, detect things uh, as quickly as they happen, so almost in real time. Uh, that's good for anything that measures the electrical impulse. So MEG and EEG perform pretty well, uh, FNIRS and fMRI not so well because there's a metabolism process there. Um, for spatial resolution, spatial resolution is how precise can you image uh, the location of where the activity is happening. Uh, there, the clear uh, dominant uh, technique is fMRI. It has the best spatial uh, um, resolution. MEG is fairly good. Uh, FNIRS, uh, in this case, is the least uh, good. Uh, in terms of coverage, so how much of the brain can you image? Uh, again, F fMRI is really good there because it can image everything from the surface of the cortex to subcortical structures. Uh, EEG is fairly good because it can be, uh, uh, although it's only on the surface, it can be put together in a really dense, high-definition array. Uh, and slightly less uh, the case is the MEG system. Uh, again, the detectors can be placed uh, in high density. Uh, now, of course, the EEG can't uh, localize things subcortical, but it can uh, image things all over uh, the head and the cortex. FNIRS in this case uh, has a little bit of a, a little bit of a downside because although it can, you can place sensors all over the brain. There's a there's an upper limit to how close they can be because remember from that image the FNIRS system has to uh, shine a laser in and then detect when it bounces out. So it needs a little bit of space between the emitter and the sensor. Uh, if it's too close, then they can't uh, it can't penetrate in. Uh, so there's an upper limit to the density of the array, which limits uh, its coverage. Uh, in terms of the cleanness of the signal, uh, the MEG has this, uh, essentially is the cleanest uh, signal. Um, in terms of silence, uh, the only one that's really bad there is fMRI. It's a very noisy uh, machine, whereas the, uh, any of the electrical uh, sensors, so whether it's MEG or EEG, quiet, uh, FNIR is also quiet. Where FNIRS kind of shines relative to some of the others are in terms of its mobility. Uh, EEG and FNIRS are able to be uh, mobile. You can have people wear EEG detectors uh, that connect by Bluetooth. Uh, so Bluetooth to a device uh, with a rechargeable battery and the, partici the participant can do uh, tasks anywhere uh, and uh, the, ele the electrical activity can be recorded. Slightly less the case with FNIRS, but still those can be uh, detected uh, in mobile ways. Uh, and in terms of affordability, FNIRS and fMRI relative, sorry, FNIRS and EEG relatively less expensive, fMRI being the most expensive uh, closely associated with hospital use uh, and clinical use. So there has to be a big center uh, for fMRI use uh, and uh, MEG use, whereas individual labs uh, can have access to EEG equipment uh, and FNIRS equipment. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this should supplement some of the stuff that we've talked about uh, in lecture uh, in terms of
uh, some of the, uh, the ways neurons communicate, the areas of the brain, and some of the stuff we talked about uh, on the history and development of cognitive neuroscience.